Philip, and I, I, you know, I've had some experience working with Philip, and the amazing thing was when we set out to do a project, you knew when it was going to be starting and when it was going to end, and you'd have it done, and you delivered within three or four days of what you predicted, which gave the impression that there was a very systematic approach that was going on to yield your work. Is that right? Well, I would say that I've done it. I've done it a lot of times. I don't know whether that makes it systematic or just I've have. There's enough history. Yeah. One of the things that Julia was saying, and that you mentioned too, the idea of ch game changing, the idea, and this we hadn't talked about this before, but when language becomes radically changed, and then say, how the hell does that happen? How did Van Gogh think of that? How did, I mean. Uh, anyone that comes up with a language which is so different that people go crazy, they don't buy the paintings, they won't listen to the music, they won't go to the theater. But, and that happened when, when, the, when the first, when, when Waiting for Godot came out, people thought it was a joke. I mean, th this is within our lifetime. Yeah, this sure. is happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that when someone changes the language that radically, that no one gets it, but then very quickly, <laughs> they do. And then suddenly everything is different. Yeah, that idea of seeing something for the first time in science, which uh, is almost like seeing the world in black and white, and then somebody shows you the color, it takes a little bit of a while, but suddenly you've created the language, and, and people begin to see the structure there that was never been seen before. I mean, that's, uh, that's that uh, moment uh, of genius, to almost, and it involves a creation of language very uh, often to articulate that uh, new thing. I just want to say, on this subject, don't get the idea that... Uh, that the person who's inventing it actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's mostly become, because you're working in the dark and you don't know what you're doing, that you can do something new. But you've had a, a very clear, as I understand it, philosophical sense of where you wanted to take music. I mean, I've read, and again, uh, I could be wrong, <laughs> that you basically wanted to tear it did down I say and that? rebuild did I? it. <laughs> did I say that? No, you, you didn't. That's what I'm asking. I read it about, you know, it could be complete nonsense. Does that resonate with you at all? Not much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had the feeling, I think, that Julie mentioned that, and you've mentioned it too, that suddenly uh, that, that you're, you don't know what you're doing, and somehow you're in you work through that into a place where you're suddenly in a different place that you've ever been before. And that's the beginning of a language. And, and it's so radical that you can really get people can throw things at you and scream at you and all kinds. I've gone through, all, we've all gone through that, haven't we? In science, they talk about this as a paradigm shift. Yep. You know, Thomas Kuhn talks about this. And I, you know, I'm hearing a lot of ideas that are very familiar uh, to psychology. You have to have that raw material uh, to build creative things. And if you right. don't have that skill set, that raw material, it's just not going to work. It's not going to come out of the blue. And then that persistence is incredibly important. The ability to push on. The, the world doesn't want to hear all your creative new ideas. Um, and to be able to push through that and persist over time is incredibly important to force that paradigm shift over time for people to come on board. Um, it really sounds familiar um, uh, to the scientific revolution that Thomas Kuhn talks about. S sounds the same as art. <laughs>